My name is Gathia Mikaelian. I'm an anchor and reporter at KTVU Fox 2 News serving the San Francisco Bay Area. Today we're talking about how COVID-19 is affecting the arts, specifically in San Francisco. I have three outstanding members of San Francisco Symphony joining me to talk about how they really are artists without a stage and yet their work is carrying on. So join me in welcoming to this talk Barbara Bogatin, cellist for San Francisco Symphony. Welcome to Scott Pingle, principal bassist at San Francisco Symphony, and also to Eugene Isotop, principal oboe at San Francisco Symphony. Thank you all for joining me. Good to be here. Thank, Thank you here. for having us. Of course, Barbara, let's start with you. You're the longest serving member of this group at San Francisco Symphony. You have suddenly found yourself an artist without a stage. How does it feel to have the season so abruptly canceled due to COVID-19? Uh, well, I think I can speak for all of my colleagues to say it was really devastating. And our, our, the way we like to spend our time is playing music for people, for audiences. We so are, feel so connected to our audience and to not be able to play for them. I mean, we practice at home. We do some uh, videos that we sometimes with colleagues remotely, sometimes with clones of ourselves on split screens. But uh, it's really not the same as connecting with our audience. It's been very hard. Scott, when was the last time you were on stage with the symphony? Well, it was uh, right before our tour uh, was supposed to happen. And uh, what, what, guys, what was that? That was the well, first March 12th. Yeah, March 12th. March. Was, we were in a rehearsal, and um, and then they they ended. Or well, we came for a rehearsal, and that's the day, right? That they that they said that that, that we're not going to be going on tour. Yeah. And it was just the reality and the um, gravity of the situation finally registered fully with me at that moment. Um, just how serious this was, because I mean, I've, I've never been through a pandemic before. I don't know about you, but uh, you know, this is uh, it's just unfathomable. And uh, but we're starting to try and fathom it now. And and um, you know, I was very sad not to be able to go to Europe and, and share the music with everybody, but most of all, just all the regular performing with my colleagues and for our beloved patrons and uh, just making music together and bringing it to everybody that loves to listen to it. Eugene, what did you do after receiving the news that the tour was canceled, that the season has been suspended? What were your first thoughts and actions? Well, as my colleague said, um, it really is devastating um, to be, um, especially, there's never a good time for a pandemic, but uh, all of us had so many things that we were looking forward to. And um, I just uh, find myself thinking um, everything I know, the, the rhythm of life is on hold, the music making, the teaching, and uh, seeing our colleagues on tour is on hold. Everything was on hold. So the first thing I did, I just went to the park, actually, and I sat down on the park bench. It was the most beautiful day and everything seemed absolutely perfect actually with the world on the outside, except for the one thing that uh, is the most important to me and uh, in the lives of a musician is uh, not not being able to make music. So it was, it was a very tough day. Um, I, I happened to be at the symphony, um, I wanna say sometime in February for one of your music for families, I think it was, you know, what, what, was it the American West or it was something along those lines. And I remember because when we, we took Bart in and um, there were some people wearing masks and, you know, we were careful not to touch anything on, on mass transit, but you, you kind of felt like we were in the early stages. And now that we're in it, I think back to that last performance at San Francisco Symphony. And I think how grateful I am to have just kind of, you know, grabbed that, that ring right before the shutdown. And I think about that performance and it's amazing, Barbara, how music can sustain you, especially a live musical performance really can sustain you even when you're outside of Davies, Davies Symphony Hall, you know, back at home in your little tiny kitchen. Um, is that something that you're hoping more and more people are really realizing? I think that uh, everybody that I've talked to misses the live music so much. And when we do come back, I think there's going to be an entire, uh, not just a resurrection of the love of performing and listening to music, but how, how healing it can be and how, how much, how deeply it touches all of us. But what Scott had said about our going on tour, we were scheduled to leave on March 16th for New York to play at Carnegie Hall. 
and we were kind of and then we were going to London after that and then a lot of different places in Europe so it was I personally didn't believe that it was going to be canceled and then on the 12th just a few days before we were to depart we were told Carnegie Hall just canceled the rest of their season and their first uh, day of cancellation was our, our first concert at Carnegie Hall so uh, it was a real cr crushing blow not only to not play all those wonderful concerts but also especially uh, to not be able to complete the season with uh, our beloved music director MTT. Right, and, and we're going to talk about the celebration of Michael Tilson Thomas, 25 years, this is his last season with the symphony. Um, it's just incredible to think about, you know, the, the stamp he has really put on, on music, not just here in the States. Um, Scott, when you think about what Michael Tilson Thomas has meant, you know, either for you or for the symphony as a whole, what are, what do you think are some of his greatest contributions? Well, that's hard to quantify because he's yeah. done so much. <laughs> But, uh, you know, over his 25 year tenure, he's um, had such visionary leadership and expanding programming to um, more adventurous avenues. Uh, he's uh, brought forward the depth and meaning of many of these great masterpieces that we've played over the years uh, through his educational initiatives, such as the you know, children's concerts and family concerts and uh, the Keeping Score series in particular. Uh, his prolific work in uh, generating recordings, um, both audio and video, um, on SFS Media, which is bearing a lot of fruit right now as we get into the MTT25 uh, celebrations. Um, and that's enabling us to still have a connection with the symphony uh, online, even though we're not, you know, doing it live. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, tremendous, it's, it's a tremendous thing that he's done with this orchestra. Eugene, you're the principal oboe in San Francisco Symphony. Um, the oboe it is, it is such a special sound, of course, in the midst of many special sounds. Um, I, I, I don't know if you were uh, on stage, I assume you were. We happened to go to um, Peter and the Wolf last, last Christmas or the one before, um, and just the sound of the oboe and the duck. Is it something that you really hope maybe newcomers to the symphony might be able to put that two and two together of it's not just this fancy music locked up in a special fancy box but really it is for everyone it is absolutely for everyone but you really had my hopes going there by by describing the oboe as a really special sound and then like most people at least at first you went straight to the duck from peter ah! and the wolf so um but yes that's one of the things that we can do um and you're right it's a special sound uh you know everybody on the stage a lot of people, when they come to the hall, especially newcomers, they, they don't realize that what you're hearing is actually live sound. So everything you hear, it, it's, it's almost like there's like a weird alchemy that we all get a chance to struck, blow, hit something that's very much alive and organic and something happens and there's no amplification. So that's really rare um, these days in this completely digital world the digital world that has given us so much, including this possibility to communicate still. But that is a really amazing thing is how we can bring the music of uh, composers for the past 700 years up to now and create it usually with such uh, organic means. It, it, it's an amazing thing. Yes, it's absolutely for everyone. It's, it's amazing really how perfect you sound when you're playing inside the symphony hall. We saw the Star Wars movies. We saw A New Hope and uh, Empire Strikes Back. And can I tell you from the minute that those first chords struck, I just got chills and shivers. And I thought, you know, and I, I whispered to my young son, I said like, they're doing it. They're making this music as we're yeah. sitting here. And, and I was as much watching the conductor as I was the actual movie on the big screen. So what was any, were either any three of you playing those nights, Barbara, you're nodding. Oh, good, you yeah. all were. Yeah. I think we all were. Star Wars, <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> Since you mentioned the films, we've done so many films over the years, everything from Charlie Chaplin to Steven Spielberg to uh, The Matrix to um, Wizard of Oz. And one thing that I noticed, having done that so many times now, sometimes when they would play just the clip of the film without the music, the emotion is so much flatter. And then I mean, when we played Raiders of the Lost Ark, when you heard that power of the whole orchestra uh, expressing the emotion of what that everyone was feeling or the tension was building or the excitement of finding what they were looking for, 
the music added so much. And that's something I've really come to appreciate much more having played the music to all these films now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're talking about, in large part, the music of John Williams. Um, and it, you know, when you think about the, um, the, the, the fact that Michael Tilson Thomas has really harnessed American composers and, and put them, you know, forefront there. Um, American composers go way beyond Aaron Copeland. Um, you know, Scott, is, is there anyone in particular whose music you love to play under the direction of Michael Tilson Thomas? Well, you mentioned Copeland and, and uh, you know, that Michael was a personal friend of Aaron Copeland's. I know that there's obviously others we can talk about, but um, one of my favorite projects actually was when we did the Keeping Score video series on Copeland. And it was so fun playing Appalachian Spring with Michael and him telling us various an uh, anecdotes about Copeland as it, it, his thoughts about the piece. And, and, uh, and I remember once he stopped the rehearsal and he said, look, Aaron in this moment used to say, you know, don't overdo it. It's the piece is sentimental enough. You don't have to, you know, overplay this. And just hearing little bits and things like that, it was, is, is remarkable. Uh, you know, that's just part of Michael's vast connections throughout his history, which is uh, tremendous. Can we talk a little bit about Michael himself? I've never had the pleasure of meeting him. I saw him once uh, at, a, at an arts event and I just sort of, you know, I took two steps back and just and gazed at him. Um, is, is he personable? Is he funny? Is he strict? I kind of imagine he has to be all of these things. Barbara, you, you were actually at San Francisco Symphony even before Michael Tilson Thomas arrived. So you've yeah. known him the longest. Give us a little bit of insight into this man who has really become something of a legend. Well, I can give you a great story that I think really personifies uh, the change from Maestro Blumstedt to MTT. So I had been here a couple of years with Mr. Blumstedt as, a, as an extra, and then one year as a full member. And uh, Maestro Blumstedt is a magnificent conductor. He still conducts us now. He's about 92, I think. Um, but he's a very disciplined conductor and a very thoughtful and serious musical personality on the podium. And when he would give us instruction, it would be very precise and tell us exactly what he wanted us to do. And he'd repeat his instruction several times in a very uh, controlled and, and extremely careful way. And um, he was very formal as a personality, really old world European. He used to call people in the orchestra, Mr. So-and-so. He always called me Miss Bogotten. And I felt very intimidated even to speak to him. I felt like I had to study the score before I could say hello to him. Um, and then when Michael first came, he had been here about a week, I guess. And um, I had never really been introduced to him. I didn't even know if he knew who I was. I was sitting last chair cello. In those days, we had assigned seats. So I was way in the back of the section. And um, I found myself after about the second week he was here, I was coming into the backstage door for a rehearsal the same time Michael was coming in. And so I thought, well, I guess I'll go introduce myself to him. And he saw me and he gave me a great big smile and he said, hey, Barb, how you doing? And I thought, whoa, things are changing around here. And so uh, as a conductor, he was very much that way too. He was getting us to open up and just express ourselves freely. And um, he brought that wonderful sense of freedom to the orchestra, which I think has continued for these 25 years. And Eugene, not a lot of people associate freedom with symphonic music. I, I, you know, I was last chair second violin for what felt like a hundred years. And I just remember thinking, if I don't do what the paper says, I'm going to get called out. But, you know, as, as, as an artist, Eugene, do you feel that you have some freedom to interpret the music under Michael Tilson Thomas? You know, and how is that maybe different when, when you're playing with other conductors? It can be very different. And um, actually, it's very true that uh, we have to combine seemingly two very contrasting things, opposite things, in fact, because we do have to com uh, combine total freedom uh, with total precision. So if you will, you know, in this weird body of orchestra, it's, you know, we have total democracy and autocracy, and it sort of changes from bar to bar, from note to note. With Michael, as Barbara mentioned, uh, uh, one of the many wonderful things uh, about making music with him is that there's the trust and the positive uh, energy that he just exudes because he wants you to really tell a story in the most evocative, daring, that's a Michael word, very daring way. And, you know, I, I was thinking, uh, um, I know we'll probably talk about this a little bit later on, but uh, in this in this final weeks uh, of Michael's tenure here, um, uh, how to describe 
somebody asked me to describe Michael in, in, in like a word in a sentence and very hard, of course, impossible. But the first thing that came to mind is being together on a stage with him. Uh, it just makes you realize that you feel like a kid in the candy store because he has so much curiosity and so much joy about making music, about sharing music with the people on the stage and with the audience that it kind of feels like for the first time, like, wow. I mean, we have so many pieces that we've played together and uh, in other orchestras. And whenever a musical event occurs, a musical experience, it feels like it's for the first time. And that's a really wonderful thing that's very special about making music with Michael. I was lucky enough to see him uh, conduct once, and it was the opening of the symphony, uh, I think maybe two falls ago, Itzhak Perlman was the, the, the guest. Um, and I will never forget how at one point, Mr. Perlman was, was walking off the stage and it took a little bit of trouble. I think he was walking you know, with his hand braces and um, everybody of course dove into their phones and started you know, doing the things that most people do. And Michael Tilson Thomas said, you should not be looking at your phones. This is happening now. And I just thought that was such an outstanding thing. Just to, it's like he grabbed us all, you know, by the cheeks and pushed us back to what was happening on stage. And I thought, this is the only time in my life I will ever get to be here, you know, with, with this maestro on the stage and this legend playing right next to him. And I just thought like, of course we need to put the phones down. And I don't know that many conductors would have said that, but I was like, you, you just, oh, Michael Tilson Thomas. I don't know if there's anything like that, Scott, that, that, that you've heard little moments, um, from Michael Tilson Thomas that make you go like, oh, that's the kind of person he is. But to me, that meant a lot. Oh yeah, that's that's a very typical thing of, of, of Michael to do. And he's not afraid to, um, you know, uh, turn and let the audience know his thoughts. <laughs> Michael's a pretty open person uh, in that regard. And um, uh, so that, yeah, that story, I, I remember that. And and he's absolutely right. I mean, we th that's one of the beauties of, of what, what it is that we do and, and Michael, uh, is all often very much in the moment and music is in the moment in the now in that present place is there's peace in that and there's truth in that because of the chaos of the future and the perception of the past is is, is very complicated and but the, in this moment right now and I'm finding that a lot in this situation because there's so much that I cannot control and I have no control over and that's very hard uh, but trying to be centered and grounded and in the moment and practicing on my instrument, um, uh, is, is, uh, there's a lot of peace in that. Let's talk about what's coming up uh, through San Francisco Symphony's YouTube channel. It's MTT25. It's a year-by-year -year digital tribute to Michael Tilson Thomas featuring Audra McDonald, Susan Graham kind of leading us through the years. Um, if I can ask you each, to, is there one thing you're looking forward to seeing or hearing or perhaps even learning about as long even that you've all been working with him. And, and Barbara, I'll start with you. What do you hope to either see, hear, or learn through MTT25? Well, what's really great is uh, each year that he's been here, starting with uh, the 95, 96 season, they have on the symphony website and the YouTube channel music that he's conducted, uh, memories from different musicians, um, recordings that we've done, archival recordings from that time. and seeing it go year by year and the pictures, the photos, the memories, you know, the symphony, it's not just a bunch of musicians playing on stage now and then. We're a real family and a community and we've shared our lives together. So over for me, over these 25 years, we've shared our loves and losses and births and deaths. And then each year I'm reminded of things, oh yes, that's the year I took my children to that concert or uh, I was pregnant with my daughter during this concert. And in 9-11, uh, 2001, when we played Mahler 6, that performance was so powerful and so gripping. And I'm sure not just for the musicians, but for the people who attended those concerts, when they see the, the memories of those years, they relate it to things in their lives too. And so for me, it's a real reminder of the, how, how wonderful the symphony has been all those years and how connected to each of us in our individual lives. Eugene, we're lucky in the Bay Area that Michael Tilson Thomas is, you know, he's, he's kind of like Willie Brown, right? Everyone knows him, uh, you know, and we'll still know him even when he's not the mayor. Um, is there something that you hope perhaps new audiences will learn or, or will look for when they come to the celebration of Michael Tilson Thomas's 25 years with San Francisco Symphony? Yeah, I hope, um, 
I mean, everybody's experience is going to be different. Um, every, every night is different for the audience as well as for us. Um, this project is a really wonderful thing because, um, as Barbara said, it, it gives not just the audience, but all of us a chance to reflect on these 25 years. I was not part of, of the entire 25 years. I'm uh, a veteran member because I started 25 years ago and then I went away to Chicago Symphony Metropolitan Opera and then I came back five years ago. So when people ask me how long I've been here, I don't know how to answer that actually. But um, uh, to answer um, what people hope to take, um, you know, Michael is really big on saying this and I, I first heard this from him when I was a member of New World Symphony in Miami when I was a kid. He said, there's two things that are most important about musical performance. One is how people feel during, and the other one is what remains with them afterwards. And because this project, this, this 25 years, this final thank you from all of us, from the city, from the music community to Michael, it gives us a chance to reflect on everything that was. I hope that, well, first of all, all of us will have, and everybody who will have the curiosity to tune in will have, immense gratitude or at least um, have an idea of the immense body of work that Michael has done for all of us on the stage and the audience and the community. But also uh, to spend more time in this world, I hope people will be more curious, curious about what it is that we do because there's so many things that, uh, that people don't know what's going on and there's so many uh, stereotypes that, that you know, we have to overcome. Everybody thinks uh, that we're so, you know, the show Frasier, which I love, by the way, uh, I have this conversation with people like, are you guys like a bunch of Frasier characters that you have uh, caviar and champagne every night? You have to wear, you know, the penguin suits. And I mean, maybe once a year, <laughs> but the rest of the time, it's, it's what remains with people after being a part of this is what's important. And I hope, I hope people will have the curiosity to see that. I know, Scott, that Michael Tilson Thomas has done a good job of sort of throwing open the doors to Davies Symphony Hall and really trying to invite everyone. I mentioned we've been to several Music for Families concerts. I know the symphony does a great program every year inviting school children in, uh, many of whom have never been to the symphony before, even though they live, you know, maybe just three miles away. Um, what do you think will be Michael Tilson Thomas's lasting legacy, Scott, in that sense of, you know, we're not just a bunch of people in fancy evening gowns and tuxedos, you know, eating caviar and sipping champagne. Well, for Michael, he was always very concerned about the meaning in the music. And you can see that in his video projects, but also just the way he would run rehearsals and he would talk sometimes at length about a certain passage and how it should go and why. And because it, the music is part of our humanity. And, you know, we need this music because it's a connection to the magnificence and beauty and meaning and truth. And uh, we need it in times like this. We need it in times that are good. We just need, we need it all the time. And, and Michael, uh, I think that him bringing forward that truth to, and to everybody, he, he was very inclusive. I mean, this music is for all people, uh, no matter where you're from. And, that, and that's reflective in our touring and, and bringing this music to people the world over. I personally, I have students from all over the world. People, they love it because it's just, it's so powerful. And um, so I think that, Michael's efforts through the performance and through education are going to be a big part of uh, his legacy. Well, as you've all mentioned, there is a wealth of information and more importantly, good old fashioned music uh, right now on the San Francisco Symphony website. I signed up to get an alert right before the big live event, which is happening on June 28th. It's going to stream live on the San Francisco Symphony YouTube page. Um, so again, that's kind of the big culmination of all this. If I can talk finally just for a minute of getting you guys back on stage. Um, Barbara, I'll start with you. Is there something that's of most concern to you? Is there something that's uh, of most excitement to you? When are you looking forward to getting back on stage and how do you think you'll, you'll deal with that day when it comes? Uh, well, one thing I've noticed is that every time I hear music and not just symphonic music, but really practically everything, I get weepy because I suddenly feel the depth of, uh, the the emotional content of that music and, and somehow in a much more accessible and instantaneous way uh so i imagine that whenever it is that we're back on stage uh, i'm gonna have a nice big box of kleenex right next to me on the stage because i'm sure i'll need it eugene how about you you know um 
the not knowing is really hard for all of us. And it's true that we occupy ourselves with trying to somehow bring music to ourselves, to our students, to as many people as possible with various projects on YouTube, like you mentioned, Facebook Live interviews, all kinds of things. The media has been really helpful that we can do this. And that's, that's helpful because it, it unites us. It gives us and our audiences a sense of uh, sustainability that you know, this is just for now. And that's helpful. The one thing is, you know, there's so many wonderful shows about food on TV, for example, Iron Chef and all this other stuff. You can look at food, you can see how it's prepared. But there's no substitution because at some point you need to be nurtured by it. And um, the not knowing is very hard, but obviously I hope as soon as possible. And um, this, the end of this can't come soon enough. But in the meantime, we'll do everything we can to make music a part of our lives, at least... Uh, through the many forms of digital media. And finally, Scott, what are you either looking forward to most, most concerned about, about getting audiences to return to Davis Symphony Hall? Well, uh, on so many people from all over the place that I talk to uh, who are not musicians, uh, I've been doing a lot of personal calls to donors and, and patrons uh, on behalf of the symphony over uh, the, the month of May in particular. And so many of them that I spoke to just miss it so deeply, so terribly. And I do too. I, I'm kind of with Barbara. I'm probably going to need a box of Kleenex next to me or something. You know, I tend to experience things rather intensely and I, yeah, I don't know what I'll do with myself when I'm back amidst the orchestra and in, in that, that sound and that vibration and, uh, and that, that work together that we're going to do. And I, I, I very much look forward to it. And, um, and I, I, like Eugene said, I mean, this, this can't, end fast enough, but we have to be patient and endure and use whatever tools we have to try and make the best of it. Well, I, I am with you with the box of Kleenex. You know, my, my boys sometimes look at me in horror when I start crying, when I hear even just Appalachian Spring or something, you know, you've heard a million times and I say, it's okay, you know, crying can actually be good. <laughs> so um, I, I just, I have to give you a round of applause. The, the, the magic and the music you make on the stage there has changed my life. And, and that has allowed me to help guide my two little boys, you know, through their, you know, school band, trumpet, you know, clarinet, just all sorts of, uh, you know, it, it's just the widest range of options for them. And I, I love live music so much. I never thought I'd go from, you know, back chair, second violin for a hundred years to someone who's able to talk to members of the San Francisco Symphony. So I appreciate you all, Barbara Bogatin, cellist with San Francisco Symphony. Scott Pingle, Principal Bassist at San Francisco Symphony, and also Eugene Isatoff, Principal Oboe. Thank you all for joining me. I will be watching with you on June 28th, streaming live on the San Francisco Symphony's YouTube channel. The big goodbye and thank you to Michael Tilson Thomas, MTT25. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for so having much. us. Of course, it is my honor. And if you'd like more information on how the arts are affected by the pandemic, you can find it anytime at coronavirusnow.com.